Hey everybody, and Tony here, and now the time has come in which I talk about my personal gateway Nicktoon, or even Nickelodeon show, the one that has made me introduce me to the world of Nickelodeon, and one that I still love to this very day, and, well, one that I'm actually very excited to talk about right now, and that is none other than Rugrats, which was created by Gabor Chupo and Arlene Klasky, and has had a lot of memorable writers, including that of Steve Vixton, Joe Ansel Labahir, and Paul Germain. Now, I will admit something right here and now. I was not a Nickelodeon kid growing up. I was mostly addicted to Cartoon Network, and I mostly found myself tuning into their network a lot more than Nickelodeon. It wasn't until one fateful day that aside from, like, going on a... PlayStation 1 shopping spree with my parents that I managed to purchase this, well, PlayStation game called Rugrats in Search of Reptar. And I was not so sure how I, how I was going to, like, be impressed with this game. And surprisingly, this was a, this was pretty much a gateway, or rather a loose gateway in what I was going to get myself into when it came to the Rugrats. And then I also saw the Rugrats movie, which, well, I wasn't really familiar with the entire show, so I sort of went in head first with this movie, which came out in the Philippines about 1999, and I was like seven years old back then. And I watched this with my grandma, my maternal grandma to be specific. And, well, that's how I managed to get into the show. And the first episodes that I've watched were No More Cookies and that episode in which Chaz has to give his kid or Chucky and Tommy and Lil and Phil a bath after they've been like completely dirty. And then he has these two sock puppets in order to quote unquote entertain them once they take a bath, once he gives them a bath. So those were basically the first episodes that I've watched. I even saw it in the Philippine television network GMA also at that same age and I was actually quite interested of how my love for this iconic Nicktoon would go and surprisingly it was pretty much my gateway tune gateway Nicktoon to be specific yes I was sort of okay with Hey Arnold and Keenan and Cal all that Cat Dog, Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life, and even to the adventures of Pete and Pete. I mostly cared for the Nicktoons more than I ever cared for the Nickcoms, funnily enough. And every time I saw Rugrats, it was like, wow, I really enjoyed the scenarios that they get themselves into, and I definitely enjoyed the show as a whole ever since I was a kid growing up. So more than anything, even if I declare this to be my gateway Nicktoon, how well does it hold up? Did it hold up very well or did it not stand the test of time? Let's find out. Now let's start off with the basic premise of the show. Basically, you have these babies by the name of Tommy Pickles, Chucky Finster, Phil and Lil DeVille, and the toddler, who is three years old at the time, Angelica Pickles. Each of them having their own interesting adventures and seeing how they perceive the world around them. And sometimes, and most of the time, Angelica seems to give them false information or even outright, outright deceive them of what these type of things really are. Even though they do find that, okay, it's not that bad, it's actually really fun. So, this show really is very interesting and very fun because this show, the entirety of each episode in this in this cartoon, tells the tale that of how the babies see the world around them. It's basically their view of the world and how they see it. And they turn every mundane situation into something that is more exciting and a lot more thrilling and at times full of fun and whim. That's what I really loved about the scenarios that the babies get themselves into. And at times Angelica is there to cause a lot of doom and gloom 
but the babies still have a lot of hope that the world that they see around them is something that's very beautiful, very fun, and very engaging. And I, as the viewer, felt very engaged with their journeys as well through the world that they perceive. And even with the adults, of course, they look at it as nothing because, well, they've they've actually grown up with it and they're used to it. But with the babies, it's very interesting to see how the world is in their eyes. And it's actually very fun and very interesting. And at times, the show is not afraid into going to some things a lot more mature, like death or, or divorce or many other things that a lot of people struggle to this very day. And especially with one telling episode, which was I Remember Melville. Now tell me you did not cry when you saw this episode. Well, actually when I first saw it, I surprisingly didn't cry too much. But even as I grew up, I found out, man, this episode is very serious and it manages to handle its topic of death really well and very maturely. And that's what I found so, so surprising with this show. For a show that talks about babies, you might think that might end up becoming mundane or boring or uninteresting, but it becomes a journey that each of them go through and becomes a lot of fun as well. And one that I definitely enjoy watching even to this very day. I enjoy seeing them go through a lot of wonderful adventures and like form great places by using their imaginations. And this pretty much is a show that is never afraid to be creative. And that's what Rugrats really is for me. A show that really is creative in its execution, deep, meaningful, but most importantly, fun. It is just a lot of fun to see these characters really like communicate with each other and how they see the world around them. And it's just a lot of fun. An interesting trivia. There was this one episode that was deemed too mature for the creators. And that was none other than the trial in which there is like a courtroom scenario in which they, the, the babies start acting like adults and start in, interrogating the other babies of who did this. Where were they at the scene of the crime when the lamp was broken? And well, Klasky and Shupo basically got an, an argument with Paul Germain and Joe Anso Lobahir and they basically quit the show or quit writing for their episodes, which, well, they managed to stay on for some time and managed to make their own show. And they were basically transferring to Disney in which they made their own show that was that was really successful as well, Recess. And you could tell that there was a lot of what was to come with Paul Germain's and Joe Ansola Bahir's creation, Recess. It was basically through Rugrats, that their creation for this show was pretty much predestined. I mean, in Recess, you have kids of how they see the, the world around them, and you see how they see Recess. With Rugrats, it's pretty much the same approach, or rather the similar approach as well. So, and even then, some of the episodes didn't even feel like the same with newer seasons coming up, and even more movies coming up. I mean, people complain that the episodes with the Rugrats was no longer the same when Dill debuted on screen, and they felt like he was a very worthless character. And, well, even when Kimmy came on screen, and they felt like she was another character that was rather pointless to have. So basically, when you think about it, Dill and Kimmy were basically like the scrappies of the show, mostly because... Yes, we all get it. With Angelica, I'm supposed to... There are times I'm supposed to hate her because she's the antagonist, but at least she does show moments of a personality and brilliance. With Dill and Kimmy, it's like they add little to no weight from time to time. And ultimately, this kind of led people to think that, okay, they're pretty much dead weight, even after like 13 years of the show's viewing. And at times, people have also complained that the writing quality 
with the uh, progressing seasons with Dylan Kimmy have like dipped in quality. But even despite that, the writing, the story, and everything about the show in terms of its storytelling still holds up very well for me because, well, despite the problems going on behind the scenes, I could really see a lot of wit, charm, whimsical moments, and a lot of deep moments as well, and moments that I could just definitely sit back, relax, and just have a huge smile on my face just to see these characters go through a lot of very interesting and very fun adventures. Now, the animation, well, what more can you expect from a Klaski Chupo done animation? It does look kind of weird for some viewers, but nonetheless, it's very colorful. It's very much detailed in its own special way, and it's rather interesting to look at. And, well, the pilot's animation, and even that of the first episode's animation, and also that of the first season's animation, was a bit more chalky, and the outlines were kind of minimalistic. But it was safe to say that the usage of color, lighting, shadows, and many other like important stuff when it comes to the visual arts are used well in this show. And it's very pleasing to look at at times. And even when the even when it came to the later seasons, the art style managed to be a lot more colorful and the lines have gotten thicker, but it still manages to maintain that color and that detail that makes the show really well loved as well. So overall, I really do like the animation and how it's developed. And, well, like I said, it still holds up to this very day because it's still very pleasing to look at and pretty much great, especially when it comes to the various dream sequences or the various, um, like, um, imagination sequences that the babies have, especially with Angelica. I mean, everything is just well done. It's just very colorful. And you could really see the color bursting throughout the screen, especially when it came to the imagination sequences. The one thing that I also love about this show is also the music, which is composed by Mark Mothersbaugh, who a lot of you know as a great composer in a lot of films, cartoons, TV shows. He's basically a veteran composer. And with this show, he wants to come up with something very simple and very much well, soothing to the ears to listen to. And I really love the usage of the xylophone. I love the usage of the synthesizers. I even love the usage of some of the human voices as well, which really adds a sort of simplicity and sweetness and a sort of charm to the show, which would, which is the reason why I really, really enjoy the theme song. Well, the original theme song of the Rugrats. The revamp theme song that included Dill and Kimmy and Susie, I'm not too crazy about because, well, it, is, it was basically turned into something that was like a generic pop song. But when it came to the original opening and the music that was used throughout the show, there was always a sense of whim, charm, and just a sense of wonder because you're basically watching a show in which this involves babies and how they see the world around them, you might think it's uninteresting, right? Well, the writing and especially the music will prove you wrong, and especially the animation. Because this is a show in which the music is used to heighten whatever situation the babies get themselves into. And it's used very effectively, and it's used with such wit and charm, and just a warm, fuzzy feeling that you get, especially when you listen to the background music and especially the opening. It's still one of my most favorite openings to listen to and one that I cherish so much. So basically, a huge props to the music, especially when it comes to having a man like Mark Mothersbaugh on the helm. And now we get to the characters who are some of the most memorable, lovable, and even enjoyable characters that I've seen. Oh sure, some of them can be kind of basic, but those are mainly on the one-time characters, or the characters that don't really appear that much. But still, despite that, this show makes great use of their characters and how we see them 
and how we enjoy every single presence of them. So let's start off with our main protagonist, Tommy. Tommy is basically a one-year-old baby who is very idealistic and is pretty much the group's leader. He's someone who has a very strong mindset for his age and someone who is very brave, very fearless, and someone who is willing to conquer the unknown and someone who almost for the most part seems to go on the straight and narrow. He's basically like the pure character of the show. And that's what I truly love about Tommy Pickles. He's definitely someone that I pretty much look up to because, well, he has very strong principles of what he believes in. He knows what's right. He knows that he knows that what he what he wants in life is something that is good for him. And you can tell because he also has two very loving and supporting parents. I mean, when you think about it, Dee Dee and Stu are practically always in charge of Tommy's life. So that's pretty much the reason of why Tommy is pretty much the way he is. Because he has a very loving family in the form of Stu and Dee Dee. Now let's get to his parents. With Stu, he is an aspiring and even um, a toy mechanic who is trying to make the best out of his inventions and is very capable, but more than once they turn out to be total flops, whether it's by an accident or whether it's because of something that was sort of a miscalculation. What I really love about Stu is that despite his many flaws and failures as a as a toy manufacturer or one who loves inventing toys, I can really see that he has balanced his passion for toy invention with his total love for Tommy. And that's what really makes him a very great father. He's someone who wants to make sure that his son has the best in life and he wants to make sure that, well, Tommy is happy that he knows what's best for him and that he is always going to stay by his side no matter what. And you could really tell that he pretty much raised Tommy and then later both Tommy and Dill really well. And you could really see why I deeply respect him as a father. He is someone that he is very supportive. He's someone that can balance work and time and he's very much a well-rounded person when you think about it oh sure there are times that he can be a deadpan snarker but when you think about it he's a genuinely fine character all throughout and then you have his wife Dee Dee Pickles now Dee Dee is always someone who tries her best to be the best mother that she can be mostly by following advices from this child psychologist by the name of Dr. Lipschitz. And she does her very best to try to become the best mom she can be to Tommy because she knows that deep down, all she wants for her son and then later sons are just to be happy, healthy, well-raised, well-mannered, and just, well, just be plain good people. She is totally up there with the likes of Lois Foutley from As Told by Ginger. She's definitely someone who has paved the way for probably some of the best Nickelodeon moms that I've seen on screen. And what more can I say about Dee Dee Pickles? She's someone that is not only a great mom to both of her sons and raised them really well through the guidance of Dr. Lipschitz, but someone who's also pretty much shaped of how Nickelodeon mom should be, though that mold has ended up being like done a lot better through Lois Foutley, but all I can say is that Dee Dee Pickles was someone that I also looked up to so much, and I'm sure that a lot of moms and kids looked up to so much. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising that even a lot of dads even look up to Stu Pickles as a, as a sort of role model for them on how they should raise their kids as well. So overall, I have to say that both of Tommy's parents really, really are great parents, and you could really, ref you could really see how it's reflected on how they raised Tommy. And then you have Chucky, who is Tommy's best friend. Chucky is a red-haired, two-year-old boy who has a lot of moments of panic attacks, and has is very well known for 
for being asthmatic as well, for having a constantly cloggy nose, and for having a lot of fears as well, even though we see a lot of shining moments in which he conquers them. He's pretty much the precursor to Macy Lightfoot of As Told by Ginger. And, well, what I do love about Chucky is that, yes, there are moments in which he is uh, pretty much like a scaredy cat. So I think it's he's not just a precursor to Macy, but he's pretty much also, let's say, Shaggy Rogers' successor as well. And it wouldn't be any surprise as well, because the traits that Chucky shares with the likes of Shaggy and Macy is that at times they get scared easily and they have a lot of panic attacks, especially when it involves the unknown. And that's what I truly like about Chucky. I mean, you have Tommy, who is someone who is brave and very idealistic, and Chucky, who is rather unsure, but is definitely a very faithful friend to Tommy. And that's what I truly enjoyed about Chucky. He's someone who's very faithful and someone who I enjoy watching on screen every single time. And his father, Chaz, well, you could really tell that he's also a pretty good father as well in his own special way. You could see how well he's raised his son. You could see that he's a well-meaning father, the nice guy. And, well, you also get an interesting backstory of what also happened with Chucky's mom. I mean, the writers implied that Chucky's mom, Melinda, and Chaz had a divorce, but in the Mother's Day episode, it was stated that, or rewritten, that she was dead. I mean, I do agree with Patricia from Old School Lane. It would have made a lot more sense that Chucky's and Chucky's mom and dad would have been divorced, making Chucky a child of divorce, which could have made the situation for him a lot sadder. But I guess they kind of needed that plot point of Chucky's mom being dead in order to have um, Chaz's new Japanese wife, Kira, and along with her baby daughter, Kimmy, to be like the new, um, the new rebuilt family. But still, I could really see that Chaz means very well as a father and someone who does have some panic attacks from time to time. But he's also a very well-meaning father and someone who's very nice and someone who is a pacifist whenever the adults start fighting. His shining moment was none other than Family Feud, in which his biggest shining moment is that he calls out Betty, Howard, Stu, and Dee Dee for constantly bickering each other over such trivial matters. And that's his shining moment for me, which I'll get to later when I talk about my top 25 favorite episodes of Rugrats. So overall, yet another great role model in the show that can be found in Chucky's dad. And then we have the twins, Phil and Lil DeVille. These are two one and a half year old twins that really love anything that's gross. They're fun loving, they're rambunctious, they're pretty much like, they pretty much work well off of each other. Lil likes to be the girly and the organized one, whereas Phil likes to be the rowdy and the the rowdy and the more disorganized twin. And even though they have their differences, they actually stick well with each other from time to time. And they actually share the bond really well, and they're pretty much a lot of fun to watch. They're definitely enjoyable characters as well, and just a lot of fun especially when it comes to the hijinks they get themselves into. And then we have their parents, Howard and Betty DeVille. Now, Howard is a, an everyday nice guy who is kind of effeminate, so to say, and is pretty much like the sweet guy. And Betty is completely the opposite. She's athletic, rambunctious, and pretty much a rough and tumble gal, whereas with Phil, he is, uh, excuse me, not Phil, <laughs> Howard. <laughs> How, yeah, because Howard was also voiced by Phil Proctor. <laughs> so Howard is basically also the the sweet, very um, touchy-feely type of person, whereas with Betty, she is the rough and tumble, rambunctious gal. And their dynamics as parents really work, and it's just a lot of fun. Yet another fun adult that I really love to see is none other than Grandpa Lou Pickles. 
He has a lot of funny and memorable lines and extremely quotable lines in the show. And especially that scene in which, well, he kind of shows a cover of an X-rated film, which involved two voluptuous Martians. Yeah, pretty much getting the censors off the TV with that episode as well. But despite that little thing, he is definitely a grandpa that is also as well-meaning as Tommy's parents. You could really tell that Tommy definitely does have a very strong family, especially when you have Grandpa Lou in the mix. I mean, he's a no-nonsense grandpa. He's someone that can have the tendency to be pretty upset at Stu because of his crazy inventions and pretty much call him out on them. And at times, he's also the voice, is re voice of reason as well. He's someone who, despite being a crotchety old man, is someone who has a lot of strength and someone who has like a lot of willpower inside him and someone who is very much uh, someone who is past the, the duty of like being a patriarch to Stu. And you could really see that very much, even though Grandpa is still the big old patriarch of his family. And then you get to Angelica Pickles. What makes her so memorable is that, yeah, she is the spoiled brat. She is the antagonist that we pray to God that we don't meet in real life. But here she is, grazing her way in the screen and pretty much being a, pretty much being a huge bitch to the babies and pre pretty much bullying them. And... That's what I found very interesting about Angelica Pickles. Now, the only reason why she would probably be that way is also due to the fact that it's also because how she it's also because of how she was raised. Now, when you think about it, both of Angelica's parents are very much workaholics. So, the fact that their workaholic attitudes managed to be reflecting through Angelica Pickles really does show you that Angelica is definitely a very interesting character when you think about it. She's also a very interesting antagonist because as opposed to Tommy and Dill, who basically have a lot of natural love with their parents, Angelica's parents are mostly loving towards her because they can compensate the fact that they have a lot of work by just being like, by just calling her and pampering her and buying her all the best stuff, especially on Drew's part. And especially with Charlotte's um, CEO nature and very much autocrat nature does Angelica pretty much emanate though. So if you think about it, Angelica is a very interesting character, despite the fact there are mo that there are a lot of moments in which she can be such a huge bully, especially towards the babies. And there are times I kind of found myself like, like hissing at her. I found myself kind of like telling myself, go, go on girl, don't bother them. And there are times I actually feel pretty satisfied when she gets a comeuppance or two. And there are times I kind of get pissed whenever she doesn't get a comeuppance. But every time she gets a comeuppance, there's a, there's a huge smile on my face. Take that, Lucy Van Pelt. At least Angelica can take whatever crap that she's got thrown at her. So yeah, with Angelica Pickles, she is definitely a very interesting character and an equally interesting antagonist to the babies. And with, like I said, with um, Drew Pickles, he's also very fun and, inter and interesting character as well, but he's not really a great father to Angelica, especially because of the fact that, yes, he's also overworked, but manages to overcompensate the fact that he's not really a great father by buying a lot of presents and favors for Angelica. And with Charlotte's nature, being a CEO and all that, it doesn't really help her as well to become a better person. But even then, they're very fun and very... Well, interesting characters, even though I don't really care about them as role models. But still, they're just a lot of fun as characters. And then you have a lot of the other characters in the show. With the with Dill and Kimmy, I am sort of indifferent with them. With Dill, he's basically, well, added into the show because he has to look cute and basically talk gibberish a lot. Which I found rather pitiful because, well... Dill would have been an interesting character as well, but he felt kind of wasted and was just only a, was just only an excuse just to have Dill be all cutesy all around. And with Kimmy, I'm not really that crazy about her character. I mean, she's there are times that she can prove herself to be a character, but she didn't really resonate with me. So overall, there are a huge cast of characters that I can talk about in the Rugrats, but it's just safe to say that they're all great characters in their own special way. 
and they pretty much have a lot of great variety. And that's another thing, an aspect that has made the show hold up to this very day, not to mention the voice acting. You have such top-notch voice actors like Elizabeth Daly, Cheryl Chase, Kath Susie, the late Christine Cavanaugh, who, after she retired from voice acting, passed the role down to Nancy Cartwright as Chucky. And then you have Phil Proctor, and then David Doyle, who, after he passed away, gave the gave his voice, or Grandpa Lou's voice, to Joel Lasky, who himself is also a very versatile voice actor. You have Melanie Chartoff. You have Jack Riley. Heck, when it comes to the guest voice actors, you have the likes of Grey Delisle, Mary Kay Bergman, um, Jennifer Hale, and several other voice actors that have made a career on the show. And, oh, and also that of Michael Dorn. And even in the later seasons, you also, you also had Amanda, Amanda Bynes voicing Taffy, though I did not really care for her character. So it's very safe to say that the voice acting, whether characters have main roles or supporting roles, cameo roles, you name it, they all do their very best to make the show as memorable as possible. And I cannot stress that enough. So overall, I'm actually really astonished to see how well this show has held up after all of these years. I could still love the writing and the concepts given for this show, and it's something that has left a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. And for that, I give it a well-deserved 5 out of 5 stars. Go watch it if you haven't heard about it already. I mean, unless you've been living under a rock. But for those of you who've already watched this show, then I highly suggest that this is definitely worth the rewatch. And what did I think about the three, three theatrical films and plus the spinoff that it had? Well, you'll find out later this week. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in to my top 25 favorite Rugrats episodes. And for that, good night, everybody.